Hey guys, in this tutorial we are going to take another look at sine curves. We're going to start by looking at what we can do with sine curves in a let's go with a one-dimensional direction, so just a, just a simple amplitude value and then we're going to take that exact same sort of principle and we're going to apply it to a two-dimensional level so that we can start to get some surface geometry out of this as opposed to just some curves. So we're going to be creating something like this. All right. So we're going to start with the brand new definition and we're just going to be working in the top view for now so I'm going to maximize that. And I'm going to start off by dropping down an expression. So we're going to we're going to set up our sine function as sine open parentheses and we're going to use uh, w times t. W is going to be our, our sort of uh, our, pe our period or frequency and then t is going to be our parameter along the curve. Alright, let's, uh, let's get started. We're also going to change these inputs to w and t. Um, I prefer to use w and t just because of the that's what we use in conventional physics. Well, instead of W, you use a, uh, a, a symbol called omega, but it's, oh, it looks similar enough to a W. Okay, so we're going to plug in, we're going to grab a range for starters. And like we did in the other sine function tutorial, we're going to drop down a domain. And we want that domain to go from 0 to 2 pi. So it starts at 0. So I'm just going to drop down a slider here. I'm going to give it a maximum value of, uh, let's go with 12. And then I'll also grab a pi component. And so this pi component can basically, will basically just give you multiples of pi. So I'm going to plug, I'm going to change my slider value to 2. And so now we're getting 2 pi. And I'm going to grab another slider and this is going to be how many steps I want, and I'm going to set it to a maximum of 360, and I'll probably set the value to 360, and then I'll plug that in. So that's our T value, and we also need a period value. So I'm going to set this to... Um, actually, one's probably all right. All right. Uh, no, you know what, I'll set it to two. Okay, so now we're going to get a construct point component, which can be found in the vector tab right over here. And our x value is going to come out of this range, and our y value is coming out of here. And so at the moment, we have set our, very, our, our period or frequency to 0 0.25, so it's going to give us a quarter of a full sine wave. So I'm just going to set that to 1 and there's my full sine wave. Uh, also drop down an interpolate curve component so that we're not viewing it as a series of points. Alright, there we go. Now, uh, what else could we do with this? What I'm, what I'm going to do is I am going to make a few copies of this omega value, or this w value, and I'm just going to graft it and then I'm going to plug these in. And you'll see what's going to happen in a sec. Basically, we can plug these in and we can get multiple sine curves or multiple uh, sets or uh, subsets of sine curves. There we go. So we have the full sine curve, we have the half sine curve, and we have the quarter sine curve through here. Now, what else could we do with this? We could maybe instead of, uh, you know what, let's, uh, let's try something. Let's do some sine sums or some sine multiplications. So in order to do that, if we're going to be, uh, okay, let's grab a parameter view so we can see what we've got coming out of here. I'm going to plug this in and we've got three branches with 361 items each. So I want to take, I want to split these, I want to reverse this uh, tree structures that what I actually have 
is 361 trees, each with three values. And the way I do that, if you've seen my data, st uh, my data structures part two tutorial, is a flip matrix component. So we're going to flip that matrix, and that's going to basically swap all of these values with all of these values. And so now we should have, there we go, 361 branches, each with three items. And now we'll drop down two different components. One of them will be a mass addition, and the other will be a mass multiplication. And these are really cool components, because what they do is they just multiply or add every single value together in a list. So this mass addition component adds everything in oh, all these first three items, or these three, the next three, so on and so forth, the mass multiplication will multiply them all together. So we should be getting just one value out of each of these. And so what we can do with this is we can use this as our y value instead of just the uh, result of the sine function. And so this is a really cool way to transform sine functions by adding together various results that you'll get. And so uh, we were, we don't just want to plug that straight in there because at the moment we've got we've got 361 lists with one point each. So if we plug that in, it's uh, it's not really going to do anything that we want. So what we need to do is we need to flatten this list. And so now you might be wondering, ah, oh, what is going on here? Um, in order to illustrate that, I'll unflatten that and I'll flatten this Y input. And then I'll make a copy of this and I'm going to take my value coming straight out of here and we'll unflatten it. And so what's going on here for this, uh, what, what this is doing is it's taking all of these three values at any point, it's adding them together, and it's constructing a new point up here somewhere. And so then over here, it'll say, I want to add these points, as well as the corresponding point on this, uh, and that will result in a point somewhere along here on the line. And so we can, this is a really cool, easy way to transform sine functions. Um, what we could also do um, is, let's say we want to make all our values of sine positive. It's a really simple thing to do. We just take our sine function and we square it. Um, I'm just going to turn these off. And I'll plug that into my y value. And so now we get this. And if we compare that to just an ordinary sine of, of wt, so what it does is it squares every single value along here and returns the result. And so anytime you square a negative number, it's always going to result in a positive, which is why you can see that this new graph that we created of sine squared omega t does not go below the x-axis. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's try a different kind of transformation. I'm going to copy this down. And this one is going to be sine of omega times t plus k times sine of omega times t. Now this is quite a cool one. We also need to drop down, or we need to drop in k value. And I'm going to set my k between negative 10 and 10. Cool. So when I plug that into k, and then I plug that into, you know what, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll compare it to the normal sine curve. So we'll just replace this value here. And uh, you'll notice, or you might not notice what it's doing just yet, but as I shift through this, you should be able to see what's going on. I'll just set this, I'll make a copy of this, 
and set it to negative 1 and 1 for now. Okay, so what this is basically doing is it is skewing the sine curve. We can either skew it forwards or we can skew it backwards. So it's just moving this crest point or this trough point backwards and forwards. Which uh, I think is a pretty neat uh, sort of way to mess around with the sine curve. And then we could plug in the rest of our values into W. And then we could once again plug them into here. Uh, let's see, we'll plug it into, yeah, we'll plug it into the flip matrix. And we'll see what's coming out of here. So now as we skew this back and forth, now we're getting some really cool transformations. And, we've st and we can still edit these. And there we go, that's a really cool way to mess with sine curves. Alright, now let's transfer this into a surface. So I'm going to make a new document. I might just copy over all of these expressions and these values. So I'll copy all of this data because we're going to basically reuse all of this. Okay, now I'm going to create a rectangle on my plane doesn't matter how big you make it or whether it's a square or not, um, just reference it into Grasshopper using a normal curve and turn it into a surface. Also move all of this a bit further forward. Alright, now we're going to divide the surface and before I go any further I'm going to hide this curve I'm also going to go into perspective mode. Alright, I'll turn the surface off as well. And so, I just want to illustrate, actually I shouldn't have hid my sign on my rectangle. Here's a really neat trick that I came up with a while ago. Um, I'm going to, to get the dimensions of the surface, I'm going to use a division component and divide the u span or the u length over the v length and then i'm going to grab an integer slider set that to a maximum of 100 and then i'm going to grab a multiplier and i'm going to multiply uh, let's see my result by the slider value and then i'm going to plug that into my u and i'm going to plug the slider into my v so you might be wondering what I'm trying to do with this. Well, basically, this is a really cool, or this is a really simple way that you can ensure that you'll always get uh, a square or a square set of points as a result on your surface division. So if I'm if I'm just using a single slider, you'll notice that um, I'm getting all these rectangular results out of all these points, which is absolutely fine. You can do that if you want. But for me, I like to get uniformity across the entire surface that I'm working with. Uh, of course, you could plug in two separate sliders, and you could, you know, maybe bump that one up to 12, and then you'd sort of sit here and guess, ah, maybe, maybe somewhere around 8 will give me a reasonably square result. But uh, if we do it like this, then we can, we're basically calculating the most square result possible given the values we have. There we go, you can see they're all still pretty square. Alright, so that's that. Uh, next we're going to take the surface and we're going to scale it up. And we'll scale it about the center, so we find the center of the surface using the area component and we plug the center in and then I'm going to create another slider which has a maximum value of 5 and I'll plug it in 
And then I am going to get an evaluate surface component. And so we'll plug our scaled result into here. We'll turn these off. And now we want to evaluate the surface um, along its U and V direction. And a really cool tool for doing this is the multi-dimensional slider. We'll plug that into the UV. And so now, well, you might not notice any result at the moment, and that's because we need to reparameterize the surface. Remember, reparameterizing the surface turns the whole surface into a 0 to 1 coordinate plane. So instead of this being, whatever this being, uh, 0 on the surface and this being 211.7, this is 0 and this is 1, and this is 0 and this is 1 as well. So when we evaluate the surface, we can slide this any which way we want and get a result much simpler. Alright, so now we are going to use a distance component to find the distance between this point and all of these points. And I'm also going to flatten these points because we don't need the structure to them at the moment. Alright, I'm also going to take this number down just for now. Alright, so now we've got a distance value. And if we want, we can now plug this into our parameter value. And this will give us a whole lot of results for our sine surface. I'm just going to move all of these away. Okay, so this will give us a list of values between negative 1 and 1. So I'm going to use those as an amplitude value of which to move all of these points from this list. So I'll plug my points into the geometry and I'll plug my vector into t and you won't notice anything straight away. Well you might actually, you can see a bit of wave to that surface or to those points. I'm going to turn this off to make it easier to understand what's going on and now we're going to use a surface from points component. So this wants a list of flattened points. Um, here's, a, oh, here's a key thing to explain. Um, I'm just going to unflatten this temporarily. Okay, And now we want for our surface, we need to get the number of divisions in the U direction. Um, we need to plug an integer into here because sometimes there will be some rounding issues when we're trying to connect into the U value of our surface grid. Okay, and so if you remember in the, uh, what tutorial was it? I think it might have been in the uh, data structures tutorial. We talked about how anytime you're doing divisions, the result is, or the resulting number of points is always going to be your parameter value plus one. So we're going to plug this into here and I'm going to change this expression to u plus 1, get rid of the y and change the x value to u. And now when I recompute that, we're now getting the result we want. Okay, so if I plug this into my u, you'll notice ah, it throws an error. Why is that? The u count is not value f valid for this amount of points, and that's because we always need to flatten list of points coming in. If we don't flatten it, then Grasshopper cannot create a surface from it. Alright, so we've got a surface with a minimal amount of wave to it, so I'm going to add a multiplier in here. You might be wondering why I didn't apply the multiplier straight in the uh, expression, and I'll explain that in a sec as well. Let's see, my multiplier... Um, I'll give it a maximum value of 10, and then we'll plug that in. And so now as I increase this value, you can start to see our sine, our sine function starting to appear in the actual surface. It might look a bit uh, sort of low res at the moment, so we can increase our number of divisions. And then we'll just uh, bake that out to get a look at it. 
There we go. Really nice, smooth, signed surface. Alright, now let's look at doing some signed sums. So we'll copy these three values over here and then we'll plug them all in and there we go okay so like we did with the uh, what was it with the one-dimensional sign functions we need to uh, sort of merge these uh, the data from these three results of these three values into one otherwise we're going to be getting uh, looks like we're getting three different surfaces there so what we need to do is we need to bring in our friend the flip matrix component um, there it is and then we need to bring in either a mass multiplication or a mass addition and so we'll plug those in and so that's gonna multiply all three of those results together and give us one value and so now if we plug that into our uh, our B result Let's see, before we do that, um, we do need to get these into one list, or else you'll see over here we've got three lists, each, each with 2,860 points. If we were to plug in this component with 2,860 lists, we're going to crash Grasshopper. So we're just going to flatten this here, and we're going to flatten this here, and then we're going to plug it in. And whoa! Now we're getting something really strange, and so this is the result of mess uh, of um, different frequency values across the surface. We can lower this. I don't know how interactively we can do it, just because it's probably computing. Oh no, no, it's all right. You can see we're really getting some interesting stuff going on as we slide through these values. Probably getting the most interesting result when we've got a lower lower period value. Oh, zero is probably too low, and uh, reasonably close results. There we go. Very interesting. Um, what else did I want to do after that? Um, oh yeah. So what we could do next, that is one way to do it, but you'll notice that we're getting our sign, the sort of the center of our sign function is clearly over here somewhere. We can really understand that. Um, and what if we were to add multiple sources? You know, maybe we could create something a bit more interesting. So let's do that. Instead of... Um, having three uh, period values we're going to plug in three signs or three values for our sign function generator just going to lock this over really quickly plug those in and I'm also going to need to graft the points coming into A and now we'll see what we get Okay, a bit difficult to see what's going on at first. We, uh, looks like we, hmm. ah yes, so at the moment they're all the exact, they're in the exact same place. So let's move them around a bit. And whoa, the amplitude is definitely way too high on that. So let's bring that right down somewhere. And so now, what we can get is we can basically get a really funky interference pattern, which is just the result of sine waves coming from different sources. This is a really cool pattern. Um, 
So there's any number of things you could do with this. You could you could 3D print it, you could see and see it. Yeah. I think that could be a really cool pattern. Alright. Um, we could also, now that we've got three points, we could re-plug in these three parameters and we'll make sure that our data structure is going to line up so we're going to graph the points coming in and there's three unique lists coming in so that's going to work absolutely fine and we'll re-preview on the surface okay now I'm going to take these values right down whoa check that out that is really weird. We're getting, you can almost see, actually you can really see where the source of these points is coming from. Maybe I want to take it uh, right off the surface. So I'll bring it uh, here somewhere. No, actually I'll put it over here just off the surface. And so, as we adjust these, we can get some really cool variation in the surface. Either getting like heaps of these crests and troughs, or not very many at all. My personal preference would probably be to have fewer, because that can you can definitely see how that pattern starts to lose a lot of clarity as we start messing with it, but let's just bake it out and have a look at it. I think that is super cool. Alright, let's, uh, let's take this up a notch. And, uh, oh, you know what, we could, we could try plugging in one of these. Maybe I'll try my sign, um, my wave shifting algorithm. For this we'll just use one of these for now and we'll just use one omega value and so I'm gonna plug in my distance over here and then I'll plug this into my uh, my multiplication result over here and I really need to take down the frequency. And whoa, check that out. That is a really strange result just by, I think, oh, okay. Oh, would you look at that? I've never tried that before. Pushing my uh, my period value uh, negative, it get, gives you some weird sort of some weird sort of uh, shift in the sign pattern, so that it alternates back and forth. Never never thought of doing that. But uh, what I did want to do, I wanted to keep my W value positive between zero and one, and I want to bring that right down. And once again, we can shape this surface however we want, so that we're really pushing the extents of that, uh, we're really sort of skewing the sine curve uh, one way or the other. But if we were to punch these values up to negative 10 and 10, and you can start to get some really bizarre shifting happening. Let's bake that out and have a look at it. Yeah, that's cool. We sort of get one crest and then almost like a, I don't know, I want to call it like a, a track, uh, a tire mark pattern going in between our, our crests. That's, that's really interesting. Um, and once again, we could, we could now plug this into our flip matrix 
and plug the result Ooh, before I do that um, whoops I plugged the wrong thing in I want to plug my result in um, and I'll just enable these two guys here and let's see what we get whoa that is really really funky maybe I don't like that so much maybe I'll plug in some more values for W yeah. it's not giving us too much variation Maybe not as much as I'd hoped, but it's uh, it's doing something interesting along here. But yeah, like I've been saying, just really just go nuts with sign curves. There is so much out there, so much material as well for just different ways you can transform a sign curve. So you know, just just have fun with it. Um, one last thing I'm going to show you is uh, maybe a, a way that we can preview some of this geometry. So what I'll do is I will go back to the original sine function and I sort of liked when we had these on and I might just manipulate this a little. So we're getting, what are we getting? Yeah, we're getting some sort of distinction of like a sine curve, or like crests over here and then crests over here, and a really cool way that they're adding together. Now, instead of making these into a surface, we're going to make them into a mesh. Oh, not a mesh surface, we need to do a mesh from points. So I'm going to plug my points into here, I'm going to plug my U value into the U, and we're going to do another one for the V. Um, I always like to label these just for consistency. It makes it a bit easier to understand the definition. Here's our U value over here. And we'll plug that in. And so you might, uh, you might be wondering why I'm doing this. And that will become clear in just a, just a second. Um, if we... We're going to look at also how we can use the custom preview, not custom preview, well, a form of custom preview, but we're going to do it with a gradient. I'm just going to start by setting my gradient maybe to uh, something like this, and then I'm going to find the bounds of all the values of my uh, mass addition and it tells me that all these values lie between negative 2.97 so on and so forth to negative 2.98 oh, sorry to positive 2.98 and so we're going to deconstruct that domain oh not that not the domain squared I'll just grab it from here in the math tab under domain deconstruct domain plug that in and then we'll plug our start and end into here so what this uh, gradient does is if you plug in uh, a lower limit and an upper limit, it'll set those values to here. So the start is, what did we say, so that if this is negative 3 and this is positive 3, roughly, what we're, what we're going to get is when we plug in all our height values, is we're going to get a color out of this. So what we can do right off the bat is... Uh, Meshes have the ability to uh, to add color. You can add color to a mesh through this uh, ver uh, vertex color attribute. You can't do that with surfaces or anything else. So that makes meshes really unique. And so we can. This is a really cool way to sort of visualize some of this data. And so maybe I want to. You know, I want to push this around a bit so I get this green space and then I get all these tiny little hills with just a, a red peak 
And we could uh, we could change the gradient pattern to something else. Uh, maybe I like that one a bit better. But yeah, it's a, a really cool way that you can visualize and mess with data. And then we could also just bake this out. And now we've got a nice colored mesh that we could render using Rhino Render, or we could take it into another program like 3ds Max or something, and uh, keep messing around with it. Alright, so this has been a look at uh, sine functions in one dimension, sine functions in two dimensions, using uh, sine transformations to make more complex surfaces, wave interference patterns, and we even finished off with a bit of uh, custom preview using the gradient tool. So I hope that this has been a good tutorial.